to join you. It's 11 o'clock in the east, 8 o'clock in the west. Polls have now closed in 49 states. This is the 2018 midterm election. Live from New York City and across the country, this is ABC News Election Night 2018. Now reporting, George Stephanopoulos. Good evening. Welcome to Election Night 2018. As I said, 11 o'clock in the East, 8 p.m. in the West. I want to welcome all our viewers in the West. And ABC News can project now. We have projected a split decision in the midterm elections tonight. Democrats will take control of the House of Representatives tonight, projected to get more than the 23 seats they need. So far, 16. They're on their way to getting the majority. But Republicans will hold control of the Senate, have already picked up two seats, many seats left to play. And we've just gotten results in now from the state of Florida, big governor's race in the state of Florida, where the Democratic candidate Andrew Gillum has just conceded uh, to Ron DeSantis, the Republican candidate. We had Andrew Gillum was on stage moments ago. We recognize that, you know, we didn't we didn't win it tonight. Uh, we didn't win this transaction. But I want y'all to know that is just it, a transaction. That what we believe in still holds true today. Uh, I gotta tell you, as I stand here on the highest of seven hills in Tallahassee, Florida, the campus that gave so much to me and to my wife, RJ, uh, many a days for those students who were around when we were here as students, we marched Plenty of times from this Andrew very Gillum, set. 39 years old, Democratic candidate in the state of Florida for governor, has conceded heard. there to Ron DeSantis, strong ally of uh, President Trump in the state of, of Florida. David, uh, Dave, Ron DeSantis may have also had one of the most creative and uh, criticized ads of the campaign on the floor with his young son playing with toy blocks, building Trump's wall. Said he would build Trump's wall. I mean, he was very, very supported by Donald Trump. He felt that and he made it very clear uh, that he would side with Donald Trump on all of the key issues uh, that Donald Trump has put forward, in particular the wall, building the blocks early on with his uh, son. And, and, and again, we go back to the Florida governor's race and we look at what the exit polls are showing us tonight. This is a state that helped give Donald Trump the victory two years ago, 100,000 votes, and, and the people in Florida approve of what they're seeing from Donald Trump so far. The issues, when you break it down to the issues, 40% said health care was issue number one. We knew that Andrew Gillum talked about universal health care. Uh, he talked about fighting to save pre-existing conditions. It wasn't enough uh, to allay those who, who made health care number one. They went with Ron DeSantis, obviously. You take a look at Ron DeSantis and his positions. 6% uh, believe that uh, uh, he was too liberal, which is not really, uh, doesn't really pertain to his, 34% said too conservative. 48% though uh, said he was about right. But Andrew Gillum, the son of a school bus driver, construction worker, the fact that he would come this close with a progressive agenda in Florida uh, says something about what he, the race he, he just ran. Another result coming in from the state of Arizona right now where the Democrat Ann Kirkpatrick uh, has defeated Republican uh, Leah Marquez Peterson. Uh, Cecilia, this is the seat of Martha McSally, who's running for the Senate. Two women in this race, uh, George, the, the Democrats were really trying to capitalize on this anti-Trump sentiment there. And really, this is being seen as a, a bellwether of national politics in this race. Uh, we're not sure, though, the year of the women may end up being the year of the liberal woman or not. We will find out still. Mm -hmm. Megan McCain, this one was expected to go to the Democrats, even though yes. it was a Republican seat before. Yes, it was. And still waiting again on the Senate. Interesting that she would take over for Martha McSally. Um, I really can't overemphasize how much these comments from Kristen Cinema ended up impacting the race. And I looked at some of them again. Stop your state from becoming Arizona. Uh, over the past years, damn, those people are crazy. Is this something in the water? No, the water's fine. We stole it from Colorado. A lot of these sentiments came out, came back to haunt Cinema. She's a great campaigner, but I don't think you can underestimate the power this had. We're going to be following that race. But let's take a step back right now because we have called both the House and the Senate right now. Divided verdict here uh, in the country. Matthew Dowd, let me start uh, with, with you right Right now, I mean, this seems to have ratified not President Trump, not the Democrats, but the div divisions in the country. Well, I, I think because of the way this flowed this evening, I think there was this idea that this is somehow a good night for President Trump. This is a less bad night for President Trump. On Election Day today, in the course of early vote, by a 9 percent margin, people voted for Democrats over Republicans on this day. And the president still has the lowest job approval rating. What he has is a wall in certain states that enabled him to govern. But losing the House, only four presidents have lost the House, one branch of the House, going into the thing. And it was Bill Clinton, 
Barack Obama in their first term, Barack Obama, Eisenhower, and Harry Truman. And so the president, I think, has to, in the course of this, he's got more, looks like he's going to have a larger margin in the Senate, but he's got a house to face that he's not ever, never had to face. And he's going to have to figure out what is his strategy in the course of that when he knows the country voted against him. Cecilia Vega, what are we hearing from the White House? Once again, I want to come to you in a second, but first, what are you hearing from your source in the White House of how they're looking at this? Well, right well now? we know that they've been bracing for an onslaught of investigations to come, as John and Mary were both saying. There are reports that have been out there that John Kelly has already formed a working group to, to face this onslaught of investigations. You know, Donald Trump has said that he will handle it very well if, in fact, the Demo Democrats take the House, but this has to have them nervous in some way. They will be backed into a corner. The Democrats have said they want to uh, re, re subpoena subpoena Don Jr. They want to hear from President Trump's family members. And Nancy Pelosi said her very first order of business will be going after his tax returns. And Chris, Chris, you talk to the president often. You're an ally, ally of the White House. How would you counsel them to read these results and to react to them? Well, first of all, if you react to what Matthew said, we had Obama, Clinton, Eisenhower, Truman, all who were reelected. Re okay. <laughs> so uh, if that's the result of this, then Donald Trump will be feeling just fine. I, I, I think, listen, the president is who he is. And I think everybody who keeps waiting for him to become something different because of an election result or something else is going to be waiting for a very long time. He is who he is. He will be who he is. And that will, will be what will determine 2020 will be. Who do the Democrats put up to contrast with him? Because they put up a poor contrast two years ago, and that's why he won. What will they do this time? Wait till Wednesday morning when the Democrats start attacking Donald Trump and celebrating taking over the House. How do you think this president will react? He's going to react quickly. Always He's going to point to the Senate and say, look what we just picked up in the Senate. And, George, I just want to show you this in the exit poll. If we're feeling tonight that in what's reflected by the voters of the polls today, Republican pickups in the Senate, mostly in, in, in Donald Trump states where he won handily in, in red territory already, and then you see the pickup in the House for the Democrats, this question, are Americans becoming more united, more divided, about the same? And overwhelmingly voters, 77 percent, say this country is becoming more divided. And the question is who can bridge that? And, and then, of course, the Democrats have blamed the Republicans largely for this di divide. So the, Repo the Democrats will now now have control of the message, they'll have control of the tone, and I think what everyone has said here, if they overplay their hand. I mean, remember in setting the message, setting the tone, going into 2020, remember Benghazi, remember the emails, they can set the message going into 2020. Okay, we have more, we want to take a look more at some of the results coming in on the Senate uh, right now. Let's see what we can pull up first right here. That is Arizona, as we were just talking about, close race there between Kirsten Cinema and Martha McSally there in the state of Arizona. Tom, why don't you go up to the board and show us where the vote is coming and what's out there. Yeah, so, uh, you know, when we talk about Arizona and Megan McCain can, can, can probably school us all on, on Arizona, but, but let me break it down for you in a really simple way. When we look at Arizona, we're going to cut the state like this, and about 80% of the vote is going to come from Phoenix and Tucson. Right now, it's a very, very close race. When we look at Maricopa County, that's where Phoenix is. Cinema's at 49, with 84% reporting right now. Very close in, in Maricopa County. For the Democrat to win here, she wants to be higher. When we go down to Tucson here, Pima County, she's pulling off ahead, but this is, this is a blue area. This is where Democrats do much better. So very, very close in this area. 88% uh, of, of precincts reporting. Let's see in the state. Actually, actually, a little more than half right now. But look how tight this is, 49 to 48. Still very close and still early in the night, George. Okay, let's take a look at the state of Missouri right now. Not so close there right now. Claire McCastle, Democrat incumbent, up against Josh Hawley. Not ready to project this right now, but so far, uh, Josh Hawley with a wide lead over Claire McCaskill. I want to go to Deb Roberts, trying again. Uh, Deb Roberts in Missouri. Can you hear us now? Hey, George, can you hear me? Yep, I hear you, and I hope you hear me. Well, folks here are kind of resigned to settle in for the long haul. They know that this is going to be a tough race, but the votes are still coming in very slowly tonight. St. Louis, a big Democratic stronghold, still hasn't had their votes tallied yet. So folks here are optimistic. But Claire McKeskill said to me to herself today at her election uh, place that she knows that this is going to be a nail biter. Uh, as David mentioned earlier, she voted against Kavanaugh. She knew that would cost her some votes. The state has changed. The president is extremely popular here.
here. He was here last night. Uh, he's put a lot of time into this race. Her opponent, Josh Hawley, is a very charismatic young man. She knows that this is going to be a tough race, but folks here are holding on to hope, and they know that she's going to win by her fingernails if she does it, but they haven't given up just yet here tonight, George. Republicans hoping it'll be a third pickup for them tonight. I want to go back to Florida right now. Uh, Tom Yama's over at the board. We saw the governor's race in Florida conceded by Andrew Gillum, the Democrat. What's happening on the Senate side? All right, so things have changed a little bit. Remember when we were speaking earlier, we said Gillum's uh, margin of loss was wider than Nelson. That has flipped. I, I've, I've had to write this down on my hand so I wouldn't forget. <laughs> so Gillum lost by 79,000. Uh, right now, Nelson is behind by 148,000. Scott's people have already calling, uh, I, and I've received the call. They said mathematically it, it's impossible for Nelson to win. We don't know that at this point, but it's looking like it's favorable towards Governor Rick Scott to pick up this state. If Republicans do pick up Florida, we can't say this enough. This is incredibly important for 2020, not only having a Senate seat there, but also having uh, the governor's mansion and also in Ohio when we talk about 2020. So this race we haven't called yet, but, but the numbers, if you look at these numbers and you compare them to the governor's race, Nelson is now at a, at a wider margin losing, Scott could possibly take the state. And, and potentially, Mary Bruce, if, you, if, if Republicans win Florida, if they win Missouri, that's four seats right there. Arizona and Nevada still out there. Guaranteed to have an extending majority. Could have quite a healthy majority. Yeah, and that could have a real impact on some huge fights, especially when you think about nominations. Uh, if, the, if Democrats are able to gain those seats. If Republicans have a slim majority, that will affect a lot of huge fights. When you think about Supreme Court nominations, uh, any cabinet nominations that may come down the fight, it will make those increasingly more difficult. I mean, for instance, just to throw one out there, Jeff Sessions. Uh, the, attorney the, president's, general. the president's made it very clear he's unhappy with his attorney general, widely expected to make a change there. The big question is, who could he possibly get confirmed as AG in such a narrowly divided Senate? Well, if he's got a four or five seat majority in the Senate, it's much easier. You just laid it up for me there. I'm going to have to take it over to Chris Christie right there. A lot of people wondering if you're the man <laughs> for that, for that <laughs> job. But I, I'm not going to put you on the spot on that. But We're on until 2 a.m., George. <laughs> right. Give me a break, huh? Right. But I want to ask a question. It is going to be difficult, though, for whoever the president nominates, if indeed he has to nominate someone, to satisfy both the Senate and President Trump on the questions especially of how to deal with Robert Mueller. No, I don't think so, George. I, I think that what the president wants is someone who's going to be aggressive as attorney general and is going to stand up for things that are important in their agenda. Um, but I think that the president, and you've seen him be pretty quiet about Russia, George, over the last number of weeks. We haven't seen a tweet about Russia in a long time. I think he knows that the Mueller investigation is near its conclusion. And I think what he's looking for is an attorney general who could take him beyond Mueller to do the things he wants to do to prepare for re-election. We will talk about that more later in the night. Right now, we have another switch in the House. It comes out of the state of Iowa, the first district in Iowa, where Abby Finkenauer has defeated Congressman Rod Bloom, seeking a third term. As we said, we've already projected Democrats are going to take the House. The map is starting to fill in right there, Iowa. A switch there for the Democrats. We'll be right back. Hey, you're watching ABC News Live as George and the team take a break. We're going to continue our coverage up here, upstairs, in what we're calling the Skybox. Mike Muse is here. Mike's a host on Sirius XM Radio. Thanks for joining us yes, yet again tonight. You've been watching the Gillum race closely, the Florida governor race. Andrew Gillum, the young Democratic mayor of Tallahassee, just got up and conceded. What are your thoughts as you watch this play out? Well, coming into uh, tonight, I was looking at this election as a referendum on what is America? What is America choosing to be? How are we defining patriotism? How are we defining what it means to be an American? And that's a result of all the cultural warfare and discourse that's been happening in the closing arguments of this election cycle. Immediately after Gillum won, we started hearing race conversations. After he won the primary. After he won the primary. After he won the primaries, we started hearing, you know, race conversation, race baiting, well, dog whistling, his, his, and then just his overt racism. His opponent, who's now going to be the governor of Florida quite infamously used the word monkey yeah. in, in, in a live conversation on Fox News, yes. uh, which uh, people jumped on and said, well, that was racist. So uh, that's yeah. what you're referring to. That's what I'm as, alluding yeah. to. And so I was curious to see how was Florida going to respond to that and how was Florida going to, were they going to choose culture over party, party over culture, uh, culture warfare, that is? Were they going to choose policy over culture warfare or culture warfare over policy? But I didn't hear a lot of policy towards the closing arguments of this race. And so there was some part of me that said that 
that Floridian was a rise above that um, and would definitely choose Gillum at the end. Um, but what it turns out was that that wasn't the case tonight. Uh, we saw that happening in South Florida where there was some strong support uh, for Gillum, uh, but he couldn't really take it within the middle parts of Florida and the rural areas of Florida. And so it still leaves us to wonder what does America want to be? Who are we as Americans? And I've yet to figure that out. Uh, hopefully I'll see by the end of the night. But as of right now, I've yet to conclude that. Well, yet and yet, if you're looking at this from the left, which I think you are, um, it, it, the there's a lot to cheer. A lot of women who did well. Uh, we've got your first female Muslim in Congress. You've got uh, one of possibly two Native Americans. So diversity is having, we are having a moment of diversity here tonight, at least thus far as the results come in. Yes, we can celebrate the diversity, absolutely. But in those cases where the Muslim one, you're talking about the representative who won in Michigan just currently right now, there wasn't a lot of xenophobia that occurred in, in that election cycle and on that campaign trail where we actually saw that happening I within see. Florida. Yes, so I think yes. there is a difference. So yes, we can celebrate diversity. Yes, we can celebrate women rising to the occasion and being victorious. But there wasn't in those races when it went head to head. There was no xenophobia. Right. There was no ideology. So voters didn't have a chance to get up and say, no, we will not accept this kind of behavior. Exactly. Right. Well, we saw the outcome of that in Florida and says, we'll look past that and still vote for uh, the Florida, now be Florida governor. Mike Hughes, thank you very much. Thank really you so much. your analysis. We'll continue to yes. talk to you because we're going to stay on the air yes. for quite a while <laughs> here. And every time George and the team go to break, we'll pick it up with information and analysis. For now, we're going to send it back downstairs to George Stephanopoulos. Back at ABC News headquarters here in New York, we have projected Democrats are going to take the House tonight. You see right there, they've picked up 17 seats. They are going to go beyond the 23. They need to take control of the House tonight. But Republicans will keep control of the Senate. They have already picked up two seats, several seats still out there. So we have a split decision tonight between the House and the Senate. President Trump has already weighed in, just weighed in on Twitter, called it a tremendous success tonight. Thank you to all. I want to bring in his counselor, Kellyanne Conway, from the White House. So we just heard what the president thinks, Kellyanne. Should, should I start with congratulating you on the Senate or offering condolences on the House? <laughs> Neither, George, but I did just leave the president. He says hello to everyone at ABC. There's no question that his presence on the campaign trail made the difference. In fact, he went five for five in just his stops from Sunday and Monday alone. I was with him yesterday, those three stops on the Monday. All three of the candidates he stumped for in three very different states for a governorship of Ohio and also two Senate seats in Indiana and Missouri, both of which are pickups from the Democrats. And I think when a, a president in power has the Senate, it's easier to get through judicial nominations. You've seen that's one of been big mark of his success in the first two years in office are these judicial nominations getting through 26 in the U.S. Circuit Courts and of course to the United States Supreme Court and also the executive noms. The House looks like it will go Democratic, but not by the large margins that have happened in the past. Uh, we know that President Obama suffered 63 losses in the House in 2010. President Clinton, 54 losses in 1994, his first midterms. And these presidents, these two-term presidents, found a way to work with the party out of power on things that matter to the country. President's, this president is prepared to do that, to work across well, the aisle. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. That's what I wanted to ask you about. How is this going to change the way the president uh, does business? He's now got, a, as you said, Democratic House, Republican Senate. Will he come forward with any new proposals that will try to uh, appeal to both? Well, there are a number of proposals, like immigration, uh, DACA. He tried to make a deal here with the Democrats last year. That's still on the table. And uh, certainly he just worked with Democrats in the House and the Senate for a historic bipartisan opioids and drug package. So he's proven that he will do that. Um, also, I think the Democrats, if they've got the majority in the House, will need to come to him and present also. So I think you can expect him meeting with them in short order, whoever they decide their leaders are. But this is also a president who, tend, who intends to be very busy during the lame duck session. The nation's business goes on even in lame duck, and there are a number of issues that are very important to this president in this country that he wants them to attend to as well. One of the things he talked about before, the, before Election Day was that he would veto any government funding bill that didn't include money for his border wall. That might be tougher in a lame duck session with Democrats coming in to take control of the House. Is the president committed to shutting down the government if he has to? What the president is committed to, George, is continuing on with border security. Border security is national security. That is an issue that likely helped a number of these candidates. 
on the Republican side tonight, along with the booming economy, really historic economy in our lifetimes. But also, this president has already secured $1.6 billion in funding for his wall and has made very clear that that is one component of a very large, comprehensive, complex issue called immigration. We have to do something about chain migration, he has said, the visa lottery system, also working on DACA, something he presented to the Democrats almost a year ago. It was last January. So he's still here. He's still willing to negotiate. But we can't see immigration through a single lens. Some only talk about the Dreamers and DACA. Others only talk about the border wall. This president is willing to tackle it in a more whole of government approach. You pointed out the president's success on the campaign trail, getting those Senate seats and some governor seats as well. And there's no question that where he campaigned, you did see that happen. Some concern among House Republican leaders that that created a backlash in those suburban house, house districts. And that's why you lost the House, because of the president's rhetoric on things like immigration and border security. That sounds like the blame and shame game that's really misplaced here. And here's why. You know, candidates and campaigns matter. And they're not all equal. This president did what he could do in many of the Senate races, the governor's races, and a few House races. I would point your attention to Andy Barr, incumbent congressman in Kentucky 6. That was an early bellwether tonight that everyone, including ABC, was looking at, George, because, and rightfully so, because uh, Andy was embattled. The president went there specifically to campaign for Andy Barr about two Saturdays ago because it's very important for him to go and support House members, the president says, who support free markets and freedom. There was no governor's race. There was no senator's race. It was just for the House. Uh, but I see a lot of those consultants who certainly have enriched themselves uh, through these races and perhaps lost some of the races are now going to blame uh, the, the president here. And they should think about that because candidates and campaigns matter. Were they inventive enough? Were they creative enough? Did they raise enough money? Uh, there are other, there are some candidates who lost tonight on the Republican side who distanced themselves from President Trump too. That is their right and we respected that, but they lost anyway. Because the president uh, is not going to have the House in Republican hands anymore, one of the things we saw him just before the end of the campaign say, maybe he should take a softer tone. Is that what we're going to see? Well, we always welcome that. And the president also said at the end of that sentence, George, he would like to take a softer tone, but he hasn't been able to, that it's been a rough and tumble game. He thinks he's, that he has been treated unfairly, that sometimes people focus on personalities and not policy, or they're focused on politics and not principles. He would very much like to continue forging ahead on behalf of this country. This booming economy has to keep going. We hear from job creators, job holders, and job seekers all across the country that they're just doing better. I think in your own polling, it, it suggested that most Americans feel economically anyway that they're more buoyant or they're more secure. We want that to continue. Tone matters and tweets matter, but really policies are what most Americans focus on. And I think the issues today were very important. You saw a lot of star power go to marquee races, like in the Georgia and Florida governor's races, for example, and, and those candidates came up short. Uh, that doesn't matter as much, I think, to many voters than the issues. Kellyanne Conway, thanks for your time this morning. Congratulations on the Senate. We'll see. We'll look forward to talking to you tomorrow. And we'll be right back. You're watching ABC News Live as George and the team take a break downstairs. We continue our coverage upstairs in this area we're calling the Skybox. And we have a special <laughs> guest, Anna Marie Cox, host of the podcast with friends like these on the Crooked Media Network. So it gives people a sense of where you're coming from politically, yes. the Pod Save America world. Um, so that would be the left. That would be the left. Yes. Um, so one of the things we were just talking about um, before we, we came on was that you're saying you're not comfortable with describing tonight as a split decision, even though the Senate goes or stays with the Republicans, the Dems take the House. Well, I just feel like there's so much implied by that phraseology that isn't correct. I think split decision implies there's an equal outcome for both sides, that somehow it's a tie. It's not a tie. More people voted for Democratic candidates than voted for Republican candidates. It's only a Do we split know that yet, though? Or um, we're trending in we're that trending direction. in that direction. Um, you know, they won the House popular vote, um, and it's that's sort of what to, to how to think of it. It's a popular vote versus electoral college thing, and it's and it's the problems of 2016 for the Democrats, sort of you know all over again. 
which is to say that Democrats are running up their totals in the places that they already have or they're already trending. And Republicans are successfully turning out voters that weren't always turning out in cycles past in the sort of rural red districts. What is accurate in terms of a split decision is maybe something to talk about a split personality. Because what we're also seeing is a country that really just has two poles and not a whole lot in the center. So one of the things I really like about your podcast with friends like these is that you talk to people with whom you disagree. Yes. What do you think the next two years are going to be like given what we're seeing about uh, what appears to be the political makeup in Washington? I may have to go to more than once a week. <laughs> On your podcast, yes. Um, you know, I think that it's getting harder to talk to people you don't agree with than easier. I mean, I, I really am concerned that as a country we're sort of hardening into these ideological identities um, rather than what used to be called cross-cutting identities. Like, you used to be that, you know, you, you were Republican and something else, right? You were a Democrat and something else. but. People are really kind of solidifying into those identities, especially on the Republican side. As a Republican Party, it's more and more homogeneous. Um, to be frank, like the Democratic Party has more cross-cutting identities. The Democratic Party is more of a coalition. People can be of different genders, of different sexual identities, of different religions, whereas the Republican Party is pretty like a white, male, Christian. Yeah, white, male, and Christian. Um, and rural, too. Um, so. We need to develop our skills to be able to talk to each other, but I worry that for people who identify as Republicans, it's going to be harder for them because they live in enclaves where there are a lot, aren't a lot of people that are unlike them. Um, and we're not doing a very good job as a country of creating opportunities um, for us to talk to each Couldn't other. Couldn't it also be harder, though, because of how Democrats potentially handle this big dose of power that's now going to come their way? I mean, do you, have, do you have any concerns about how the Democrats are going to comport themselves uh, with the subpoena power and the possibility of impeachment, et cetera, et cetera? Like, am I worried about, like, Democrat Benghazi? Is that what you're... <laughs> uh, let's just say overreach. Um, I don't know. I mean, we'll have to see. I mean, I think a lot of the people, ironically, a lot of the Democrats that are in these flipped districts are not sort of, you know... Um, you know, code pink activists, right? They're more, they're more moderate. The Republic, the, the, you know, the Democrats that are winning these Republican seats aren't Alexandria or Ocasio-Cortez. Ocasio Ocasio yes. They're, you the know. The 29 year old from right here in right. New York City. Right. They're Connor yes. Lamb. Yes. Right. And I don't see Connor Lamb being someone who's going to go around and do insane kinds of investigations. Um, so I think there's going to be some temperament of, of, of uh, the Democrats' desire to investigate everything. But let's face it, there are some things that should be investigated. And also, sort of to go against the split, division, split decision narrative, one devastating investigation could undo almost everything that happened tonight in favor of Trump. Anna Marie Cox, thank you very much. I'm being told we need to send you back downstairs. So go forth. But thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Let's, while she goes forth and as we like to say, gets her cardio by going down the stairs. Um, let's go to Georgia, where Steve Osinsami has been covering a race that we still have not projected a winner for. Um, Steve, what's going on there in Georgia in that governor's race? Well, the, the race is, is close, but it's appearing right now that, that Secretary of State Brian Kemp has uh, a significant lead in this race uh, right now. We're still waiting for some of the totals to come in from some of the larger, larger metro counties, but it is looking more and more favorable for the Secretary of State Brian Kemp. The crowd here isn't quite down with that yet. There's still some sense that uh, Steph, uh, Stacey Abrams could still pull this out. Um, we've been sort of crunching the numbers. Uh, we were really watching closely Fulton County, which is the county I'm in right now, and DeKalb County, which are some of the largest counties in the state and also are counties that were expected to break uh, heavily for Stacey Abrams. Those numbers appear to be in, so she's running out of real estate to make up the difference. And uh, right now, if the, if the numbers were to stop now, Kemp would win outright. Uh, we're still waiting to see, though, if they might move to a runoff. Dan? Well, I, I, one of, there's been so much rancor in this race and accusations that Kemp, who's a sitting Secretary of State, should not be overseeing election, yes. uh, a major election in which he's a candidate. Do you see that continuing to be an issue if or when we move forward here? And by the way, we just have a few seconds for you to answer that question. 
Well, there there was already a lawsuit filed today uh, asking Kemp to resign, and that will absolutely be an issue if this case, if this race moves to a runoff, because he'll still be supervising that election, which would take place in a month. Dan. Steve Ozen Sami, thank you for quickly answering a big question I asked you with limited time. We really appreciate it. That's Steve Ozen Sami on the ground in Georgia. We're, st we're still waiting for a projection in that closely watched race. One other race we want to tell you about, or one other issue that's come up tonight is uh, the people of Michigan have resoundingly voted yes on a proposition to legalize recreational marijuana. So weed is now legal in uh, the state of Michigan. Thought you might want to know that. Uh, we're going to send it back downstairs now. We're up in the skybox on ABC News.